Okay, welcome everybody to this two-part session about wireless technology. Let's start with a short introduction. My name is Ralf Leuter, running a small company in Switzerland and dedicated fully to network analyzing, troubleshooting and trainings, that's all I do. And uh, that keeps me busy all over Europe. Um, different supporting different protocols, so you can see here I also have a website if you want to visit about this. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but a little bit of uh, look back is uh, makes sense here. I started with the sniffer, original sniffer. We heard it this morning already from Cheryl. That's where uh, everything started, and here is a picture of it. That's the first unit which we bought in '88, and it was called portable PC, <laughs> about 10 kilo. And uh, the famous inventor was uh, Network General. Network General, they even registered a sniffer as a trademark at that time. So today it has become a synonym for sniffing, but it's actually, I think it's still, it's still registered, but everybody is using it now as a general term. I was working at Swissair at that time, and we were the first company covering and the whole airport area with a local area network before it was all modem based and we used a technology called token ring ever heard of this we were an ibm shop and ibm was not supporting ethernet at that time and by the way ethernet was not really really scalable uh, we had the collision at this time the same we have in wireless again so token ring was more predictable and that's uh, why we decided for this. And this was the, the first and only device supporting the coding token ring. You even you, you can see it in the symbol here of the network channel. That was actually the token. It was a small animation on the screen uh, where this uh, dot was circling around. <laughs> the price you can see here, and uh, the last thing was really my decision no trainings available at that time. So Sniff University started about nine years later only. So we had a tool, but nobody could handle it. When you connected it to tokening, you saw a lot of frames, management frames, active monitor present, standby monitor present. The same we have again in wireless. That's very common. Ethernet never had management and control frames. When you see a frame on Ethernet, then it's a, it's a data pack. It's a, a frame uh, forced by an application. Not so on token ring. You could connect it to a, to a network. There was nobody working, just 10 stations uh, connected, and there was a lot of traffic. And that's what we needed the WASH, uh, this uh, sniffer for. And then I started doing training. Uh, developing training uh, for the token ring and sniffer, that's where uh, it all started. We even had the beacon uh, in token ring. The beacon was uh, when the ring was broken and with the sniffer you could detect where the ring was broken because you had the MAC address of the stations and that's how you could isolate a broken ring and of course, uh, uh, later on, uh, more and more protocols. So that's where it all started. We have the beacon again in the wireless. We're going to talk about the beacon. It's the most frequent frame you probably see. It goes out 10 times per second from every access point. But now it's a good signal. Compared to token ring, it's the presence of an access point. What are we going to cover in this uh, 75 minutes, oh, I forgot to start my timer. I tend to make over time here. Normally I have too many slides, but uh, a lot of information, so some slides you may study uh, yourself. Another thing, uh, I pass around a, a stick here. You find all the trace files on it, and you also find the slides, also for my uh, 
uh, course on Friday about voice, if you want to go to these two. It's uh, virus free at the moment, but I cannot <laughs> guarantee if it still is at the end. <laughs> we have it online as well. Right. Second? We have it online as well somewhere. The online? The slides? Right. You have the link that you, instead of the stick? No. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> So, uh, if you want to be sure, you better make a test before you copy. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, the session one topic is um, analyzing layer one and two is required in wireless. Layer one is not a topic anymore in Ethernet, right? You plug and play. If you have problem, you change the cable or you change the switch, you, we don't have any collisions anymore in gigabit, so layer one is more or less can be done by changing equipment. You never analyze layer one anymore with a wire sharp. It's, it's not no need for this. But in wireless, it's a requirement again. We need to look at layer one because we have a broadcast domain again, which we had on day one of Ethernet with the coax cable. So we have to look at layer 1 in uh, wireless because that may be the cause of your problem. So we start with layer 1 and I'll show you a uh, tool which are useful there. Wireshark is not usable for layer 1. Indirectly it is, but I will show you this. I will lead you through different tools also, some of these Wi-Fi scanners which everybody has available what can they do and where is their limit? The, they are very handy tools to detect what is around, but they have their limit and you have to know about it. They are not real layer one scanners. Then we go into layer two, where Wireshark comes into the game, but again we have some limitations. We have a lot of limitations under Windows. The built-in Wireshark, the built-in wireless card in Europe, Windows PC will not be usable. So we have to look what is possible there and what is required. Once we look at the packet, we find out that there is additional information on the packet provided, hopefully, by your adapter, called radio tab or uh, PPI uh, pseudo header. We will see what we are going to use this for. They provide us very valuable information about signal strengths, uh, transmission speed, and so on. We have a quick look at, down at layer uh, 2, uh, layer 1, with the CSMA uh, CA, just to understand how it works, how it is possible that all these uh, mobile clients uh, work at the same time in just one media, because, as I said, said it's a shared media again, only one station is allowed to send at a time. We don't have full duplex anymore. It's really day one, Ethernet, uh, uh, coaxial cable, very simple. The good thing is, we can measure it any, at any point. We don't need a monitor port or something like this. We just put up our uh, antenna and, and grab all the traffic. Maybe we have to scan through different channels, of course. I will show you this. There is equipment available which can analyze in multiple channels at the same time. So I give you some hardware hints here, because you may need hardware in addition to your notebook for professional analyzing. If you would like to analyze roaming problems, the client which is changing the channel, there is no uh, way around using a uh, special hardware. In session two then, we are focusing on layer two exclusively. So, Wireshark here is of really big help because Wireshark decodes all these packets. And we are going to focus on the management and control packets, the one I mentioned already. We have 15 management and control packets in wireless. And you will never see them on the wire. They are just in the cell between the access point and the clients. So in order to see them, you have to capture in the air uh, somehow, either in one channel or in multiple channels, depending on what you are looking for. So 
The management and control frames are the emphasis here, not the data frame. We are actually not interested in the data frame. We do not even need the data frame to troubleshoot in the end. In most cases, they are encrypted anyway. You don't see anything, right? And I'll show you how you can troubleshoot without seeing the data. You don't see HTTP get and whatever. You just see an encrypted data frame, and you still are able to troubleshoot and find a conclusion if the air is working okay. And that's what we are uh, covering in uh, this session too. So we are going to look at the different frame formats. Frames, wireless frames are very different from Ethernet frames. In Ethernet frame, you know, you have a destination six byte at the beginning, a source, and a type field. We don't have that in wireless. We have frames with one, two, three, or four MAC addresses. You have to know them, and you have to be able to understand. So we are going to the most important control frames like beacon, probe request, probe response. Of course, there is not enough time to cover it in detail. Normally, this, my wireless classes are two or three days at least to understand, but it helps you to start, it helps you to dig into more, to get more information uh, on the uh, internet. Okay, so that's it, the full program for this two uh, sessions, and let's start with here, layer one. Layer one is the media, it's the air, it's the channels. And in wireless, you know, these channels can be used by anybody. The frequency, the frequency we are working in are completely free, as long as you do not exceed the maximum power, which is around 100 milliwatt in Europe. You can use anything, and it is used by anything. You can use your baby phone or your TV uh, signal expander or your uh, garage opener, they all, all work in the same band. And these are called non-Wi-Fi devices. They are using the channel, but they do not use Wi-Fi compliant frames. They don't have to. But they can interfere with your wireless. And that's the problem. So we will look at a tool called Spectrum Analyzer which can show you what is active in your, on your layer one. This tool cannot capture any packets. It's not designed for. But it can tell you if such a device is present in the channel you intend to use. And then you better use another one. So that's what we are going to look at. And then in layer two, I mentioned already, in layer two, we are going to look at these different packet types and understand how they work together and why we sometimes have problems. A client cannot join the access point, a client is not roaming, or there is too much roaming or whatever. And here Wireshark and some tool uh, comes into the game which you uh, may require as I, as I mentioned. Okay, let's start with layer one. Layer one I mentioned. The ISO called ISM bands or the 5 gigahertz band are free to use and it's, it's, it's important to know when we talk about Wi-Fi devices, Wi-Fi is a standard that means devices which have this symbol here, they work according to the 802.11 specs. And that means they can be decoded and captured with Wireshark. But a lot of devices do not use this standard, they don't have to use this standard, and then they are not visible with Wireshark. At least not directly. They may be visible indirectly because you have a lot of destroyed frames. They may destroy your frames, CRC errors. I'll show you in a minute how this is going to work. So again, these are not legal devices. They are completely legal but they interfere with our Wi-Fi transmission and there is nothing you can do against it except find another channel. As long as they do not exceed the maximum radiated power, they are absolutely legal. That's the point. 
good thing is that most of these devices are not in the 5 gigahertz yet. Because the 5 gigahertz chip, chips are more expensive. So these guys, these products, these uh, producers tend to use the 2.4 gigahertz chip. So the 2.4 uh, uh, network is really very crowded depending uh, uh, where you are. I said that I'm going to present some product. I don't want to make a commercial show here, but uh, I just show you the products which I use uh, on my troubleshooting. And one I use is this Wi-Spy from MetaGeek. And I have installed one here and have uh, it uh, run for uh, some minutes uh, in this room. So, just to give you an idea how this looks, here is a live uh, capturing from this room here. You see different channels here. So here we are in the 2.4 gigahertz, so you know there we have 11 channels, or in Europe 13, and in reality you can use only three channels. And it's really nice to see here, if you configure an access point to run at channel 6, it's actually using 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So this was really confusing at the beginning of wireless, uh, it was not clearly stated that the channel width is 20 megahertz. So you cannot use only channel 6. It's a spread spectrum technology which is uh, covering uh, four bands, four, sorry, four channels. So you see obviously an access point is here at, uh, at channel 6 and here you see the waterfall display which is really nice. It shows you how loaded this channel is. The so-called duty cycle. Is there still room? It is going to change color here. So this is not really heavy loaded, so there's a lot of room uh, in this cell here, so that means uh, you could here uh, do a download uh, without any problems. It, it would turn red, so the color changes to red if the duty cycle goes to uh, 80 and 90 uh, percent. So we have a, a less loaded channel 1 here and a less loaded channel 12. So that's what you can see here. So this looks pretty normal. Uh, different, different Wi-Fi have different uh, shapes. So uh, Wi-Fi offers even some uh, signatures which uh, you can use to find uh, disturbance. So certain disturbance. So this here, this looks strange to me here. You see, this small spike here, this is uh, something which is not Wi-Fi, but it's out of our range here, so it doesn't disturb. I'll show you afterwards disturbance in the range. So what you can do, you can grab one of these signature and you can uh, try to find out what uh, is probably the source of one of these disturbances. So if you suspect if it's a cordless phone, uh, you just grab this and try to match. To be honest, I never found a match, so <laughs> it's a nice feature, but uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't use it. Okay, so let's go back to our <clears throat> um, a little bit too much windows open here. Oh, I lost something. Otherwise, oh, Pi is lost. Okay, no problem with that. That's the problem with live, live demo. So, let's go back to our Wireshark or slides, yes. So, these are different uh, shapes here. I want to show you, so this is a typical shape of, uh, of a B, uh, G can channel. And you see also, uh, we don't, the signal does not sharply stop at the border. We have, uh, we also have power in the neighbor's channel, but this doesn't matter as long as the difference is uh, 20 dB. 20 dB is times 100. So here are the borders of the of our uh, channel, 
Uh, but we also have activity down there. But this is not relevant because we have 20 dB uh, in difference. So as long as the value is 20 dB lower, uh, you can uh, uh, reuse the channel. Here's some pattern typically found uh, from non-Wi-Fi devices. And you can clearly see that this channel here, this band here, cannot be used for any other purpose here. That's home offices in a fitness center uh, found. So all, all the channels are really busy and <coughs> sorry. Microwave oven, we know microwave oven, they cover the full band wireless guitar or whatever. All legal devices but make Wi-Fi transmission impossible. Channel bonding, a term we are going to talk in, uh, in uh, session two. You see a screenshot here of channel bonding. Channel bonding means adding more channels for one transmission. So you can configure an access point to use multiple channels. And then you should not place another access point in this area, right? Otherwise you have overlap. So this access point here, we are in the 5 gig band now, is using channel 36, 40, 44 and 48. Today we can go up to 8 channels with AC version. Yes. Is that different than channel hopping? Yes, that's not to do with channel hopping. Okay, so it's not using those four hopping between them? No, it's oh. using these channels in parallel. Oh. But only for data frames. That's very important for analyzing. The beacon and control frames are still in the, in the base channel. Only the first, 36. So the additional channels are only used when you start the download. So if you, have a, if you, if you set up your Wireshark and you tune into 36, you still will see the control frames, but you won't see the magnetic frame and the, the data frame. Except you have a device which supports channel bonding, like the Wave Expert or MP Tab, which we use that. Okay, so this is important to know, nothing to do with channel hopping. This is a, a parallel use of multiple channels to increase bandwidth. Nice to see here with the buy spy. So you see all four channels are quite heavily loaded here uh, in the waterfall. So that's something uh, which is indicated. Yes, I made a live thing already, so I leave this. Let's go to an example here. I have for, uh, for uh, all my uh, different part of the session, I have an example from my, from my uh, real life troubleshooting to show you how I proceeded and how uh, we finally found the problem. This was a large logistic uh, enterprise which had problem serving these cranes here. So they had two cranes unloading and loading railway to trucks, so container uh, railway. But only one of these uh, cranes was usable. So for operation it was really hard because they had to put the load on, on one crane. Because these cranes were communicating by uh, wireless Wi-Fi, the guy sitting in one of the cranes got instruction which container to which truck. But he kept losing transmission. So here is a view from top. So that's the, the large campus here. That's a sort, the sort center which was covered and we are outside here and here are the two cranes. And the two cranes uh, were connected to access points during uh, driving back and forth. But the crane, as soon as the crane was in this corner down here, he lost transmission. So only, it was only usable here in the center when he could connect to this one. So this is the campus from Google, you see here the railway and here the railway uh, connection. So I was called by this customer, most of these customers are former students. They visited one of my 
classes and they come back when they have serious problems. That's interesting for me, right? Because the easy, the easy problems they find themselves. So when they call me, it's uh, mostly a challenge also for me. And we started here, and the trace file you have also, we started here in the center and moved towards, by foot, foot moved towards here this corner. We, we knew that in this corner the connection is bad, so we had to find out what is the problem. They already have placed another access point here, you can see. So this was the original, and they have placed another one. The idea was to make the signal even stronger, but it didn't work. So let's see what we find. I started actually with Wireshark. I could have started with Wi-Spy also, but I prefer starting with Wireshark. Because with the Wi-Spy you see a lot of disturbances, always. But these disturbances may not have influence on, influence on your transmission, and then you can discard them. But you can see if your transmission is okay, and that's exactly what we did. We started with analyzing packets from multiple channels, all the channels which were uh, covered in the area, and we moved towards this uh, corner. And there's one nice thing which we are going to cover in more detail in session two. In wireless, every packet, every data packet in the air is acknowledged. That's very, very different, and it's very, very useful. So we don't have an acknowledging Ethernet or token ring or whatever, <coughs> except it's a TCP packet, right? But on wireless, we have an acknowledge on layer two. It's only visible between access point and client. So you don't get it on the wire side. And if a frame is received correctly, that means that the, the FCS is okay, the checksum, then we will see an acknowledge. The reason for that is because the wireless transmission is unreliable. When they design wireless, they realized we have to add some security, some redundancy. So if the acknowledge does not arrive at the sender, the sender will issue a retransmission on the card. It has nothing to do with application. That means the sender retransmits either the access point or the client, and on the second and the following frame, the so-called retry bit is set. So we have a retry bit, we will see this, and now it's quite easy with Wireshark to see the percentage of retransmission versus um, good packets, and that's exactly what I did here. So I did a filter here, a graph on retries, and on bad FCS. Bioshock also detects, of course, bad FCS, frames which are disturbed. And now you see here that the percentage goes up to 70% of the frames. Up to 70% of the frames have to be redundant. This is not a good factor, you can tell. You may have 1, 2, 5%, that's not detectable, but 70% it's significant you will have a real uh, breakdown in uh, your performance. So this was the first step. That doesn't mean we have the source of the disturbance at this point, but we see there is a disturbance. And then, second, I started with the, continued with the vice pie, and now you see how such a pattern looks like. So this was the pattern we found, and this is in 2.4, and you can see you cannot use any of the channels. Because you have sharp spikes here, these by sure are non-Wi-Fi devices. You can tell from the shape. And they are quite heavily, you see here the duty cycle? So they are quite consistent. And they disturb all the channels. You can forget it to use here uh, any uh, reliable transmission. But now what's the source and where is the source? Now you have to move around a little bit. Uh, Wi-Spy even uh, offers a directional antenna so you can turn your, uh, your, your around and look at the signal strength, right? 
If the signal becomes stronger, then you're probably in the right direction. Then you have to move towards the source. There is no other way to farm. And that's exactly what we did. The customer was primarily interested if the source is on its own campus, right? Then we could have solved it. So we moved towards this corner and we found out that the source is outside of the campus. It's towards the railway. And then you are not allowed to take any more actions. So we couldn't really find the source, but we could definitely tell it's not on the campus of this logistic enterprise. And then this enterprise, they had to use our uh, government uh, authority, it's called BACOM, and they come to the place and they found more or less the same uh, spikes with a tool probably ten times uh, more expensive than the one I <laughs> used, that they confirmed that there is an external source and they even found the source near the railway it was kind of this uh, monitoring uh, uh, inductions which uh, went crazy. So it, it is not this normal function, right? <laughs> so it was, it was really going crazy and uh, it sometimes was uh, oscillating for whatever reason. We don't know, uh, we didn't receive any details, uh, but uh, that was, that was the, the, the source of this uh, uh, strange uh, pattern. So what we did to make a quick solution, the, client, the, the customer just, just changed, changed the corner to 5 gigahertz. So on the, on the lower right corner, you remember, where we had the disturbances, we just changed to 5 gigahertz. Yes? Question, does the uh, capture show the noise levels, if the noise levels changes? Yes. In that uh, case? The noise level, uh, I mean the, the noise track. level are here in... Because the wire track uh, <coughs> has the noise level as well for the captured uh, packets. Yes. Does it show any pattern when these spikes happen? That's a good question. Uh, Wireshark shows the noise level when you receive a good pat pattern. I don't think that it would show this noise level here. Because uh, if it's a noise, the noise level should change. Yes, it should change. And uh, I was interested if it's, yes. it can be shown. But is okay. that, all, is okay. that all reported by the AP though? Okay. That noise level is reported by the AP in the No, no. The noise level is indicated on each packet you capture. But it's, it's sent by the AP? Correct. No, it's, it's sensed by your, ad oh, by your right. adapter. Local adapter. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure uh, because you need to capture a packet to get the noise level. But I, can, I, I guess you should see it, but I, I didn't verify. I, I, I can look into the trace file later if we, if we can find it. Yes, okay. So let's go on here. This is like a practical example how we had to use layer one. There was no way to find this problem with layer two analyzing. Uh, just it wasn't visible, it just was, the effect was visible that a lot of patterns were uh, not good enough. Okay, so let's go on uh, next topic, uh, the so-called Wi-Fi scanners. It's a little bit misleading, uh, these words. Wi-Fi scanners sounds good. It looks like a little bit like MetaGeek, but it's, it's, it's not. MetaGeek is a real spectral analyzer. These are so-called scanners. What can they do for you? They scan through the channels and list all available networks. But that's on layer two. What they actually do, they just read beacons. And I mentioned already that all access points send beacons in regular intervals. And in the beacons we have a lot of information. Not only the SSID, but also the encryption type, the, the channel bonding uh, options and everything. And what these tools do, they just list all these uh, parameters. And that's good, but that's not, that, 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 that's not spectrum analyzing. So there are free tools available. I have one here also from, from uh, on the Mac. And I just start this live and you can see here 
It really does a good job. It gives you all the SSID in this room. We also have a channel uh, in, five, in channel uh, uh, five gigahertz, and you see that this access point is supporting channel bonding. You can see it from the width from the width of uh, this uh, symbol here. So here we have uh, mainly one in channel six. We have realized this already with the device by. We have some here in one and one in eleven. We even have some part kind of overlapping, which is not a proper design here. So these are tools are very valuable, but and now the but the limitations. If you have disturbances on layer one, if the beacons are destroyed by CRC errors, you won't see anything, right? Because this tool is processing only correct frames. And that's why these tools are only limited valuable. If you have really a disturbance, what we have before uh, with layer one, then the beacons will disappear. And then this list will disappear. It will co become empty. So it's not really scanning on layer <coughs> one, it's scanning on layer two. But still valuable. You can see here all the information. You can even see the throughput here, uh, 1300 mega. Uh, bytes and so on. Uh, that's really nice and I recommend you to use one of these tools uh, in your troubleshooting, but you have to know the limitation. So we are going to look at beacons later on. I just made a preview here. The beacon frame, one of the control frames, they contain all this information, supported rates, country code, encryption, channel bonding supported, and so on. We, we important to understand what and how these tools are working. Uh, I go back a little bit, there are a lot of tools available, most of them are free. Uh, you can even run them on your Android phone or wherever, and they give you a quick overview of uh, what is around and some can even show you busy factor and because the beat in the beacon you see a regular in some of the beacons you see a busy a load factor how 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 much is the load uh, in a cell and things like this so uh, uh, it really depends what tool you are going to use now let's go to the point how to capture wireless and all of you are used that your internal ethernet card can be used to traffic, uh, to capture ethernet traffic it's very common these days because these cards they all support promiscuous mode promiscuous mode mean, means the card forwards all the packets to the wire shard Wireshark puts them in promiscuous mode. And the good thing is that you can work, use your application at the same time. This was not always possible. And with the original sniffer, which I showed you, we had to buy a, a special card which supported promiscuous mode. And there was no application uh, possible to use the same card at the same time. Today, that's not an issue anymore. But it is still an issue in wireless. So again, if you run your Wireshark on Windows, and if you start Wireshark, Wireshark will show you the VLAN card. And you even can start it. But if you have a closer look at what you are capturing, you won't see other data than yourself, other data than yourself, and broadcast. You won't see packets from other stations in the same client because these cards do not support promiscuous mode. I don't know of any card in under Windows, and I follow this regularly. I don't know of any Ethernet uh, wireless card under Windows which has the correct driver to support promiscuous mode. It's even worse. It does not show you any of the management and control frames. 
And these are the ones we are going to use for troubleshooting, right? So it's useless. The built-in VLAN card is useless under Windows. Under Windows, I have to emphasize. It's not true for Unix, Linux, Mac OS, and so on. I'll show you in a minute. So under Windows, and we saw this morning in the statistics from Gerald, more than 80% of the Wireshark download are Windows, right? So all these uh, people have problem analyzing wireless. So that's why actually, Cheryl, yes, so, can we capture under Windows only broadcasts and your own traffic, no management and control frame, and it will present you fake Ethernet format. You will not see the real format of a wireless packet, the one with the three or four MAC addresses. You will see an Ethernet header with two addresses, which is faked by the driver. macOS, for example, you need to look if your card supports monitor mode. I'll quickly show you. On my Mac, or on any, uh, or any Linux system, you find out if your card supports wireless, if you can turn on the monitor mode. So go to your capture interfaces, and you see here the monitor mode. It should be able to uh, turn on. You will see this on some Windows cards also, but one, once you try to turn it on, it switches off. So, it is not supported at this time, and that's really a sad thing. So, if you start a capture like this, you can easily find out if your adapter is supporting monitor mode. As soon as you see beacons, you're set. So, let's try it. I do a start now, and I see a lot of beacons here. So these are all management frames here, block acknowledges and things like this. So obviously my well, I have a filter here, beacon only. So you see, as soon as you see beacons, you're all set. If you see beacons, you also see the other management frames. So that's an easy test. If you have an adapter, also under Linux, Unix, if it supports. And tell me if you find one under Windows. <laughs> because uh, that's really uh, an issue. Okay, let's stop this scanner here. Okay. So that's why these RP gap adapters have been invented. And that was actually a co work between Gerald and Loris. They founded a company with the name Case Technology. That was long before I, a Riverbed came into the game. And they uh, developed this RP gap adapter, a small adapter, a USB type which was capable of capturing in monitor mode. That was really a great invention. I, I, I waited for it because the sniffer, the famous sniffer, was capable for wireless too, but only for one channel. And for roaming analyzing, this is not good enough. So we really, the whole wireless community waited for, for this kind of thing. And you could even combine multiple adapters to analyze roaming. So you could tune the adapters to different channels, like you do it here, channel 1, 6, and 11. Which is required, I'll show you in session 2, roaming is one of the most complex processes in this Wi-Fi, and it's one process which often causes problems. And you can only look at this if you look at the leaving channel and the receiving channel of a station. You can follow a MAC address of a station moving from one channel. And you will find out why uh, the station does not roam well. So this was great stuff, but 
Then Riverbed took over. Riverbed sold them a little uh, for a while. Who knows the Airpic adapter, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and they are out of date now. They do not support AC. The last uh, wireless version they supported was 11N. They do not support USB 3. So, you can use it, still use it in limited uh, environment, but they are not produced anymore and they are not available anymore. So, can we decrypt packet? Can we decrypt packet? Data packet? Yes, under certain circumstances. We are going to look at it, depends on the type of uh, encryption and depends whether the shared key is available or, or not. It will not work with certificate anyway, so I will show you this also. These are fake, these are fake Ethernet frames. These Ethernet frames, these frames have been captured on a standard wireless card with Windows and that's how they would look like. They look exactly like Ethernet. It even tells it's Ethernet, but it's not. So all the layer 1, layer 2 frames, layer 2 information is removed and replaced with a fake Ethernet frame. So it helps to analyze your own traffic because we do not have promiscuous mode. You will only see your own traffic or as you see here, a lot of broadcasts. So these are all broadcasts or multicasts here. Uh, but that's not really what you need to charge it. Here are just some links about other than, yes, and the windows. And the Windows with the new NP cap driver, you may be lucky that some you have an adapter which supports monitor mode. It's just too bad that I never came across of one really supporting it so far. <coughs> Maybe you have better experience with this. But theoretically, NP cap, uh, which is uh, comes together with the new. Uh, Wireshark version 3, it actually should support certain hardware. So we see even the list here, uh, which support, which is, uh, but uh, obviously this type of adapters are very rarely used in notebooks, so that's, that's the problem. Well, the Linux and Mac OS, it looks better, because there you can have a list of drivers and list of hardware which is supported. So I don't show it here, but you can follow the links if you need more information. How do I capture anyway? You do not necessarily need to capture in the air, because more and more you can capture on access points. Most new X generation of access points have a monitor mode. And Cisco has this monitor mode a long time ago, but it was only supported when you turn off the function of the access point, which is not a really good idea, right? Because then you lose all the clients uh, in that uh, cell. But more and more provider offer a monitor mode during operation. So you do not have to turn your access point into a monitor device. For example, Meraki, one of the newcomer in this area, which has been bought by Cisco recently, and they support the monitor mode on their access point, and that's really a, a good feature because you don't have to travel around, right? You do it from your, your desk. And what they offer is even, uh, you can even select if it should capture on the wire side and on the wireless side. So we even can see what is going out on the so-called distribution side, if you want. So uh, that's really 
a good feature. It creates packet PCAP files and you can download it and analyze it from uh, anywhere. So before you go out, have a look if your access point possibly supports capturing without the need to go uh, on site. You can download it then and open it with Wireshark. That's really nice to do this. Let's talk about this famous pseudo header. Headers which are added to the original uh, fields during capture. And this is really, again, very special. There's no other technique doing this, I know. So the device which is capturing the packets, hopefully is adding this additional information. And we have two types of headers, the radio tab or PPI, but today most products use the radio tab header. But they both provide similar information. What they actually do is, they use this additional header which is added in front of the data and it's stored with the data. But this information is not directly transmitted in the air. It's coming from the receiver. For example, we were talking about signal strengths and noise level. This is not something you transmit in the packet, right? It's useless. Because the value is different on wherever you uh, position. So the noise signal strengths and the noise level is something with it very particular to, the, to your capture point. So these adapters, when they receive a packet, they make a note of these values and add these values into the pseudo head. That means you can use these values then to create a, a profile with these values shown. So if you move around with your wire shark, you see the signal gets either stronger or weaker, or you see the noise level coming up, uh, so it gives you a good position aid. For example, you have different access points. One is 60, minus 60 dB, and the other is minus 90. So you see where uh, between the access point you will position. This was invented by this ARP cap. Air ECAP adapters. They invented this, you can find the specs. Uh, here is the link, what they actually do, but I'll show you how you can use it. You can use it to create special profiles. And by the way, I forgot. On the shark I was circulating, I uh, also gave you a, a folder with all my profiles. So if you want, you can put your profiles or take some of the profiles. You know about profiles in Wireshark. Let me quickly show you. I recommend that you do a radio tab profile and a PPI profile. So all the profiles here which I created over the years for the different technology, they are on this stick. And you can easily import them or only part of them. And you know how you do it. You just do a right click down here, manage profile, and press on this link here, and it leads you to the point where you just can add the profiles. There's a profile folder here, and in the profile you see all these different profiles here. So uh, I forgot to mention that this is also on your on, on the stick. Well, by the way, where is the stick limit? Still. Yeah. Yeah. Still here? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so I have two wireless profiles. I even have one more here. The PPI for <coughs> packet information and radio tap. Uh, depending how your capturing device has been configured, it either creates radio tap header or PPI. So you just open the file and look at what type it would stand here. It would read PPI here 
and then you just load the appropriate profile and then you have a lot of information. So let's quickly open up this radio tab header and here you see what valuable information is in. For example, the channel. In which channel this packet was captured. So this can be used to make a separate column here. In a normal packet we do not see the channel number. It's no need. Once you are synchronized and uh, uh, authorized with your access point, you don't put the channel number into the packets. The channel number is only in the beacons, probe requests, probe responses, the, all the rest do not have the channel number. So, really valuable information. The data speed. You know that we have different data rates depending on how close you are to the access point. Beacon frames are always sent with the lowest speed in a cell. So if you support multiple speeds, beacon is sent at the lowest speed. If you want to increase this, you have to remove the speeds. You can do this on configuration. If you look into the beacon, you see what speed are configured here in the text parameter. You see this access point is supporting 1, 2, 5 and so on. So if you want to increase the throughput on this cell then configure that 1 meg and 2 meg are not announced for example. That's a way of making a smaller cell and better throughput uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the controller. And then the access point will send the beacons in 5.5 uh, meg or 6 or whatever. So this information, then the signal strengths the signal strength, as I said, is something very spe specific, depending where you are placed. There are two rules where you should place your wire shark for capturing. If you are looking for problems in one cell, then move your wire shark as close as possible to the access point, because the rule says the access point has to be able to talk to all the stations, right? The stations are not able to talk to each other. They do not talk to each other anymore. Once they are associated with an access point, all the data are sent to the access point or from the access point. So if you place yourself near the access point, you should hear all the clients. But this is not true if you are analyzing a roaming problem. If you analyze your roam problem, then you place yourself close to the client and roam and move yourself with the client. Because then it's important that you have the signal strengths which the client receives, right? So these are more or less the two positions. Yes? That uh, signal strength is, is something related to the signal? signal strength related to the capturing device until again and uh, Characteristics. Yes, of course. So it means that if we have the, some good uh, device, and yes. we want to troubleshoot. Yes, that's absolutely right. What he's saying is that the signal strengths indicated here may not be the signal strengths received by your mobile client. If you have a good antenna available here, you may receive a good value, but the client has a bad one. That's absolutely true. But I'm not interested in absolute value, I'm interested in relation, right? And then you can see at what level your client is roaming. But you're absolutely right. The values which I measure here are the ones which I measure with my RP cap or with my adapter, whatever. And must not be, there is, uh, uh, may not be uh, the same like the, the client. But you still get a relation, right? Absolutely. Don't, don't, these, don't these values really as absolute, uh, take them as relation. So signal strength of, of 50 is very good. Uh, that's signal to noise ratio, not signal strength. So we have different values here. And uh, you also have noise level depending on what uh, adapter you have. So the noise is the, the disturbance signals which you always have present. Remember when I showed you the MetaGeek, you see uh, uh, around 90, minus 90, minus 100 dBm, you always see a lot of signals uh, 
the different sources, so this is the noise level. The rule says you should be 20 dB above the noise level. So if the noise level goes up to 80, you should have minus 60 uh, to, to guarantee a good uh, signal. Otherwise, if it's going below this, uh, you, will, uh, you will experience more FCS errors, more heat transmission, and things like that. Okay, the radio tap header and the PPI header. Again, the purpose is to have additional columns in Wireshark, which you wouldn't have without the radio tap header. So, minus 19. Signal noise, this is really very good signal. <coughs> Transmit speed here, the minimum in 5 gig is 6 mega. So here you see we are in channel number 100. A lot of information which we are going to need, especially later when we're looking at multiple channels. We would like to see and know in which channel which traffic is sent. So just use this field, apply as column, and you have a lot of information. For you can you can even get you can even add color to different channels, or you can add color to different type of packets. Of course, you know this coloring scheme is very flexible. You can, for example, give color to different beacons or whatever. So here is a an example of a channel to different uh, color to different channels. Let's quickly open this up. Uh, we see another control frame here. It's called the probe request. So like, you should have this file too. Probe request in channel 1611. Probe request is the frame a client sends out to look for an access point. So it's sending out the broadcast and it's scanning through the channels. So you see here this guy started in channel 11, then 6, then 1, but I'm sure this Intel station has also scanned the other channels. But I only had three channels monitored. That's why I only see channel 11, 6 and 1, because I have tuned three adapters to three channels. Normally they also scan other channels, but there are different scanning patterns. Some, some uh, adapters scan these three channels more often than the one in between, but it's not forbidden to set up an access point in channel 3. So, what I did here, I switched off all access points to show what happens then with your client. So a client is actually, as soon as you turn on the wireless, it is scanning all the time in all the channels. And if you have turned on two bands, two, four and five, it will even scan in the upper channel. So you cannot avoid this. And it's even used for tracking. In, in shopping malls, when you, when you enter a shopping mall, you do not have even to, to assign to any wireless, right? You scan with your MAC address and they get you. And then they follow you through the mall. They can exactly tell how long you move here and here, right? Because you, you're, you're moving, you're scanning in all the channels. So they can really follow you without accessing, without authorization without association to any. So your mobile phone which you carry with you, it's, it's probing all the time. And once it's, once it's uh, as, uh, uh, associated with an access point, it may reduce the probing interval. It does not stop because it, will pre if it prepares for roaming. But the algorithm is different. Once it's, once it's connected, it may, it may reduce the probing interval. So on some devices you can, you can set this, you know, on PCs. 
you have three different roaming profile. Aggressive, moderate, normal, something like. So this means uh, it should grow more frequent to, to detect a, a better access point. So this is one frame you will see a lot, and it's going through all the channels. So you may be capturing in channel one, and you will see a lot of MAC address from stations from other channels, because from time to time they come in your channel, they take your bandwidth away, they have to wait, of course, until it's free, and that's something you cannot avoid. That's also something you may have noticed if you forgot to turn off your phone in the airplane and you are traveling for two hours, your battery may be down half percent, right? Because probing, frequently probing, needs energy. So it's better to be assigned to an access point than just probing all the channels all the time. So that's why on some more and more airplanes, they try and start to offer a wireless access point. But once you are connected, the probing interval is reduced and uh, saves energy and reduces the amount of... of uh. So here, nice to see, we missed some. We can say we missed some here uh, in the other channels. The sequence number you see. So I'm sure this guy has, was probing channels uh, between. We see a very strong signal. Why? We were just sitting beside this guy. So of course we see a very strong uh, signal here because this signal was just uh, one meter away or so. So nice to see you different. And of course, you can always do a, a right click uh, on one of the channel uh, and see then activity in this channel alone. You just put uh, your cursor on this, of course. That's uh, really uh, nicely done. That cannot be done more comfortable uh, than it is. Okay. Where are you? Yes. Okay, something which we are going to cover in more more detail in the, in the second, but I give you a preview here, is the fact that every packet in the air is acknowledged. So this is a trace file which we are going to look at afterwards, and you have it too. And here we see data packets, right? You see it's a TCP SYN, SYNAC, HACK, three-way handshake, as we know it from the Ethernet. That looks exactly the same. The payload of a frame, of course, is the same. But after every single packet, we have an acknowledge, layer two. And this is very special now. This is a frame with one MAC address only. That's why the source address is, is empty. This is very special when we're going to look at it. How does this work? It works because the algorithm, which is uh, defined to access the, the air, defines that the acknowledge has higher priority than any other packet. So the station which is receiving a packet has to acknowledge the packet <coughs> if the FCS is okay. And for that purpose, this station gets more priority. And that's why we can leave off the source address, because an acknowledge is always sent by the previous receiver. So the one which was receiving has to acknowledge. So let's say here, the Philips is sending a packet to a station 00FF. And this station now sends back a packet to the Philips. So we don't see the source. This is really very comfortable for troubleshooting. If you do not see the acknowledge, you would see the rate transmission. If you see the acknowledge... How yes. does the AP know that it actually came from that device? If it has no source, of course. You're talking about uh, the acknowledge. When you send out the packet, 
you wait for an acknowledge, otherwise you have to retransmit. Remember what I said, in the air, every packet has to be transmitted, independent from the client or from the access point. So if the access point has sent a packet to the Philips, or whatever station, he expects an acknowledge to the back address on the access point. So that receipt, but that conversation is only using that that frequency at that time for that acknowledgement, and then he can move on to someone else. The, 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 yes, the frequency is blocked. Okay. For all stations. That's how we that Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, a malicious user just spew out acknowledgements. Say again. Could a malicious user just spew out acknowledgements? You could. Yeah. Yes. Then, yes. Hmm. There are plenty, plenty of ways to disturb a virus. Yeah, <laughs> virus. So, yeah. It's an art to keep a virus working. It's not an art to disturb it. Yeah. So you just, you just take a, a pure jammer, right? You take a jammer which you can bind it yeah. and then jammer frequency. So it's, it's a public, it's, a, it's an open uh, broadcast domain. So it's, it's really no problem to disturb anything. And, and there are plenty of ways of doing it. Yes. Okay, eight minutes to go. So quickly. Yes. How is this done? How we can set priority? How we can set priority in a shared media? We know CSMA from Ethernet, remember? All the stations were connected together. Before they were sending, they were listening to device, to the to, to the wire. Carrier sends multiple access. As soon as the wire was available, they could send out, but they were, set, they were able to listen during send. Carrier uh, collision detection, CD was it, CSMA CD. This is not possible in the air, no way. Because the signal you are sending out is a million times stronger than your receiver. So you better close your receiver, you would destroy it with your own energy. So you cannot run your receiver at the same time you're transmitting. So collision detection is not an option in wireless, it's technically not possible. Every radio uh, amateur knows that the, the sending power is much too much for your receiving power. So collision detection is not an option. So what they did here called collision avoidance. They try to avoid collisions. And this is done with a very clever system with different, with different timers. You may, you may Google for it, uh, but I just uh, took out the different uh, values. We're talking about SIFs, diffs, and slot time. So that's how it works. A station in this kind, in this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of access point is sending a packet to a station. In this, in this case, it is station one. So station one is receiving. Station one has detected its MAC address and it's receiving. And the last four bytes of the packet are the frame check sequence. So if this station receives the last four bytes, it quickly has to do a frame check sequence test. Very, very quickly. Because we do not want to acknowledge a bad frame, right? So, if the, the frame is bad, we don't do anything as a receiver, we just keep quiet. If the frame is okay, we should send an acknowledge, because otherwise the access point will send again. And now this SIFS timer comes into play. If I need to send an acknowledge, I can use the SIFS timer, which is the shortest timer available, to send the packet out. Do you see the value? Depending on which technology, but we are talking about micro here. <coughs> Stations which would like to send another data frame are waiting. They see the air has become free, and they start the diffs timer, which is longer than the SIFs. Before the diffs timer runs out, they find out the media is occupied again, right? As soon as the media is occupied again, they go back, draw back. So that's why the acknowledge always has priority over another data frame. And this is required 
and that's why we can leave off the source address because the acknowledge always only has been sent by the previous receiver. So we are sure that the acknowledge always refers to the previous packet and not to any, any other. So how this goes on? We have two stations here waiting to send. So once the acknowledge is sent, the media is free again, right? Now these two guys would compete. These two guys would now compete. If you, if you would only have the diffs timer, they would collide after the diffs. They would both start sending, right? So that's why we have, in addition, a random number of slot times. So in addition to the diffs, both have selected a random number of slot times. The upper station has sel uh, selected three, and the lower has selected six. So they both start reducing the slot time. They still keep quiet, and they still hope the media is free, right? So if the media is still free, and one of the guys here counts to zero, this guy can take over and send data. And now the same game, right? This guy is sending stage data to the access point. So the access point has now to acknowledge. So this station Q here, bad luck for the third time, right? <laughs> so he has to wait and hope that in the meantime not uh, station 4 comes into the play. If you look at this, you wonder that it, it works at all, right? <laughs> With more than 20 or 30 stations. So it's really kind of amazing uh, what happens here on this level. You don't see this with Wireshark this time. It's too low in, in, in resolution. You're talking about micro. But it works. I mean, the good message is this guy down here, he does not have to select another value. He can continue. He has three left, so he can take this over, right? So he can work to the front every time, every time he's... Uh, is losing the game. So we can, we can get uh, slower and slower. And now, I don't have to finish. Okay, yes. We are talking more about this in the next session. Okay, let's finish here. Yes, a little bit about hardware, just to see what is possible with multiple channel. Again, for professional analyzing, you need multiple channel. There is no way around it. LP cap is not an option anymore, but if you have time, visit the SCOS boot uh, uh, in the boot area. SCOS uh, is representative for Europe for this wave expert. It's a, a new device which supports up to four different uh, <coughs> channels at the same time, bonding up to 160 megahertz. I use it myself in troubleshooting. I was involved in, in beta testing. Uh, last year, and this is, to my knowledge, at the moment, the only device which uh, can do this uh, for uh, analyze. Okay, thanks a lot. There is more information how to configure and what is still supported, but next session we are going to talk about these frames here in more detail, so I hope you come back for that. Coffee at the reception area. Thank you very much.